Greetings, my name is Nick McCarthy and I'm the Director of Programming here at NewFest, New York's leading LGBTQ plus film and media organization, and one of the curators of Queering the Canon Rom-Coms, running April 28th through May 2nd, both virtually, nationwide, and at BAM in Brooklyn. Um, the series is presented by NewFest and BAM, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual conversation titled, Where Are All the Trans Rom-Coms? with an esteemed panel of artists and filmmakers, and we'd also like to thank our friends at Autostraddle for helping make this conversation possible. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce a collaborator and the moderator for this conversation, a writer, critic, filmmaker, and co-host of the podcast, Wait, Is That a Date? Is This a Date? <laughs> Drew Gregory. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I am so excited about this panel and our panelists, so I'm just gonna jump right in and introduce them. Uh, first, we have Reese Ernst. Uh, he is an Emmy-nominated artist and filmmaker, the director of Adam, which premiered at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival and screened at Newfest, in addition to winning awards at Outfest, Oslo Fusion, the Mezzopatra Film Festival, and was nominated for a 2020 GLAAD Award. Reese? Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, next, sorry, are we supposed to see? Okay, great. Can you, can you Hi. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I was on camera. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Thanks for being here. Next, we have Eva Rain. She's an artist, actress, and activist. She's the star of Billy Porter's upcoming directorial debut, which is a high school set romantic comedy that's set to be released later this year. Hey. Hi, Eva. And finally, we have Rain Valdez. She is an Emmy-nominated actress and filmmaker. She's the writer and star of the 2019 rom-com web series, Razor Tongue, and is currently in development on her directorial debut, a trans-led rom-com titled Relive, A Tale of an American Island Cheerleader. Hi. Hi, Rain. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation because I love rom-coms and I love transmedia and I love talking about how we need to improve both of those things. Um, I wanna start off by, okay, so I put together a list of trans rom-coms that do exist. Um, maybe we can disagree about whether they should be considered rom-coms or trans. Um, maybe I forgot things, but I just wanna start off by listing them off. So first, Adam, then Alice Jr., Better Than Chocolate, Boy Meets Girl, Girl Stroke Boy, Holy Trinity, and Some Like It Hot? <laughs> <laughs> have we seen these do we like these i mean i you know we've i've i've seen and, and like adam i'll say that right here but how do we feel about this list and did i forget anything i would add victor victoria Ooh, uh-huh i don't know if I, people have seen that one um yeah they're there are some bad ones <laughs> in the 80s and 90s that I, I don't want to list, but uh, I think we talked a little bit about them on Disclosure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that's I, a good list. Yeah. I haven't seen most of the things on that list. I've seen yeah. Adam. Um, I've seen Boy. Uh, yeah, I've like seen like Boy Meets Girl. Aside from that, everything was kind of new to me, but, but yeah. Yeah, I mean... I don't know, like, so I just watched Girl Stroke Boy. Have any of you seen that? Mm -hmm. It's a British movie from the 70s that is like sort of a riff on Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, but I think is actually like a little bit sharper. Um, but as that list shows, there's not a ton out there. Um, so I'm curious what each of you have turned to in like the absence of explicitly trans rom-coms. We can start with Rain. Hmm. Well, um, I, so first of all, I, I did see Adam, I loved it. And I saw Boy Meets Girl, I've seen that. It's been a few years. I didn't necessarily think that was a rom-com, but I saw it sort of uh, kind of gearing towards that, that genre mm -hmm. um, that like, people refer to it as a rom-com and I just kind of agreed. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it's more like indie uh, vibe and 
And, um, but I appreciate it for what it was. Um, there isn't very, to be honest with you, in terms of trans specific rom-coms, there isn't anything that I gravitate to, but there are a lot of uh, old classics that I can see from a trans lens um, mm -hmm. because of because of the 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 thing about rom coms is there's always this like high concept conceit, right? There's always this ruse or a lie or something, and so for me, I can easily find myself relating to some of the rom coms that are that are traditionally done by like white creators, and you know has Julia Roberts in it or or Sandra Bullock, because of that high concept conceit, I can level up my imagination and kind of see myself in them. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of like an actual go-to, I don't really have, I don't really have any, sadly. Yeah. You don't have like a favorite, like even among like not trans rom-coms, but like of, of those like old Hollywood or even like newer Hollywood rom-coms, do you have like a favorite rom-com in general? I do, yes. Okay, oh, so that's what you mean by that question. Yes, mm -hmm. I love- like, What have you latched onto like in the absence of, of trans rom-coms? Well, I, I mean, I always thought Pretty Woman was very trans allegorical or whatever, because any trans woman who's seen that woman, uh, that movie can relate to Vivian Ward or Kit DeLuca maybe because they're sex workers, which is mm -hmm. a narrative that we haven't really quite seen before in terms of that genre and and having it also be aspirational. And because they weren't specifically cis or trans or anything like that, like I just, in my imagination, I was just like, oh, Julia Roberts is playing a trans woman. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can enjoy it from that perspective because of the whole conceit of, you know, uh, they're doing this thing for a week, but then also they don't want anybody in the Beverly Hills circle to find out what she really is. And I found myself being able to relate to that and then having a little bit of shame when people do start to find out. Um, <clears throat> you know, she started to kind of like, well, she got angry about it and she almost left the whole thing, you know, um, uh, because of that, sort of sense of betrayal of him saying something to his lawyer friend about about what she is and so so for me it's like it's always in these these um high con high concept rom-coms or movies that like is somewhat rooted in an identity that has a little bit of shame to it but then ends up being aspirational the Little Mermaid, for example, I don't know if that's a rom com necessarily, yeah. but it kind of it kind of is, even though it's Disney and it's animation and it's, you know, um, to me, Ariel is like the ultimate trans girl because she, you know, identified well, she, you know, was born a mermaid but identified as a human <laughs> mm -hmm. and did everything she could to become that person and, you know, uh, ended up having a better life because of it, or at least, you know, at least a happy ending. So things like that, even with, um, I think one of my favorite Sandra Bullock ones, well, actually there's two, it's While You Were Sleeping and The Proposal, which are very similar to each other because again, there's this high concept conceit, there's this ruse, there's this lie. And, you know, as the stakes get higher, uh, you know, there's more of a, this, this pressure of making sure that no one finds out that she's been lying this whole time. But mm -hmm. then as she falls in love with the family and the family falls in love with her, there's this sort of like duty to tell them the truth about who she is or, 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 or how she got there um, in, in hopes of, you know, letting them know that, that, you know, I need to tell the truth because I love you all too much. Right. And so, right. Because of because of those sort of um, ideas and concepts that that are very similar, you know, like the proposal is very similar to while you were sleeping. It's just a different mm -hmm. ruse. It's just a different lie. 
Um, but I think I think a lot of people can re can relate to that, or at least find that connection. At, at least I have been able to, which is kind of why I think I love rom com so much, because yeah, that, yeah that that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Eva, what about you? Do you have a Do you have a favorite? Um, uh, well. The um the uh Little Mermaid is definitely one of my favorite films. I literally have a mermaid tattoo on my leg. Um just because yeah, I think yeah, just like the whole notion of like, yeah, like um starting out as one thing and then turning into like another and then, you know, having issues with like bottom half and just like all of those sorts of things. It's like super, super trans. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the Little Mermaid is something I've watched a dozen times. Um, fairy tales in general, I think um, there's like a lot for trans folks to kind of like pull on just like this whole notion of like magic, um, like changing, being something different than what people say that you are um, and kind of, you know, breaking the rules to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think those are the, like yeah, those are the sorts of things I've definitely latched onto. Um uh yeah, you know, like growing up I couldn't really find myself in film or anywhere on uh television or even really in books. So, you know, I just kind of tried finding as many like queer movies as possible. A lot, like most of it I found on Tumblr. Um, not legally, but I, you know, it was there. <laughs> um, yeah. so yeah, you know, um, there's like, I mean, you know, I was always just trying to find some sense of self and, um, anything queer. A lot of that are like, you know, just like super like indie movies that like don't get a ton of press. Um, but, um, yeah, those are the sorts of things I've latched onto. Um, I think also like comic books and, um, uh, and also, I mean, even just, yeah, like other like cis centric narratives. Um, mm -hmm. I try to find something there. Um, I can't really think of anything at the moment, but yeah, I mean, any sort of like love story, I'm kind of, obsessed with because I'm just sappy that way. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, a lot of movies from um, the 90s, uh, 2000 to like 2004, stuff with like um, uh, uh, Sanaa Lathan um, and, you know, just a lot of movies that were, I guess, um, thought of as like black Hollywood, like those, you know, like those are the things that I latched onto because, you know, that's something that I can see myself in. Like maybe um, gender wise, it's not super specific, but yeah. Um, yeah, those are the sorts of things that I've always kind of latched onto, really just looking at any sort of media. Um, and um yeah, I guess anything grounded in something real, but that still has that sense of like flair to it is what I would look to. Mm -hmm. Reese, you mentioned Victor Victoria. Is there, are there any others that even are like, I mean, less trans? Yeah, well, I, I wanted to touch on the the point that uh, others peop other people have mentioned about um, The Little Mermaid, because I thought that was a really interesting one to bring up. And uh, I wouldn't have thought of it as a romantic comedy, but it is, that does really work. However, it, the original, the Hans Christian Andersen story doesn't have a happy ending, of course. And mm -hmm. it, The Mermaid, it's actually quite sad, you know, and it sort of, and it, and it um, for me, kind of brings up something I was thinking about with this question, which is, uh, Rain, you mentioned the, the kind of uh, problematic 80s uh, rom-coms that we won't, that we didn't, you know, that we can put to the side. But some of those to me as like a trans person, I think are, yeah, both problematic and quite interesting. And I mean, in, in particular, some of the gender swap ones. Like, Wait, okay, I want, I want the titles. Let's talk about them, okay. even though, even I though like, we're, you know. 
Yeah, like like I feel like there could be a lot more said about some of these 80s gender swap movies that we kind of grew up on and what did they do to us as trans people or how do we feel about them? Maybe that's what you're getting at you with this whole panel. But, you know, just one of the guys, um, Strawberries, uh, there's others. So those are the those are the main two. Jo Strawberries was Johnson, Jonathan Brandis, like joins an all-girl soccer team. Um, so he, he interests as a girl and just one of the guys is the reverse of that where a girl you know, cross-dresses as a guy and then, of course, you know, falls in love with the guy on the other side. And 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 all those, in both of those cases, it's kind of like the Little Mermaid. Well, they don't die at the end, but <laughs> they, they don't they don't get their love, you know, that or actually that's not true. They do. I guess I'm, I'm sort of misspeaking. They they do get their they get the girl, get the guy, but they have to go back to the way they were before. And it's sort of an unhappy ending. It's annoying, you know, for us as trans people to that that was uh, what we grew up on. And uh, one that I came across more recently that I think is really interesting is called Something Special slash yes. Millie Willie. Do you know about yeah. this one? I do. I actually just watched it this week for this panel. Yeah. I actually really like it. Jenny Olson turned me on to it. Jenny has, who's a, uh, you know, a queer trans sort of film historian and filmmaker. Um, she owns a print of it. Um, and we did a, we did a talk uh, after the film because it's, it's, it's one of these gender reversal rom-coms, mistaken identity, you know, films from the eighties. But it's kind of weirdly, I don't know what you think about it, Drew, but I think it's almost weirdly it's, uh, just a touch ahead of its time. I mean, it mm -hmm. still falls back where uh, the main character kind of detransitions, but not exactly. They The main character sort of ends up on binary or something in the yeah. expected way for an 80s rom-com. So um, I guess we could get into a whole conversation about that film in particular, but um, I think it's interesting to look at, uh, you know, these particularly the ones that deal with gender directly and how in the past, you know, what we see as queer and trans people, that justice was not served. In fact, you know, the wrong thing happened at the end in, in that these protagonists had to detransition or didn't get the girl or something like that. But how do we think about that and kind of course correct? And, and also just like, think about how those affected us as young people watching those films and yeah. not just in all bad ways, but in complex ways, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what's interesting about that movie is at the end, like when she detransitions, like her hair is still short and like, yeah. Pamela Adlon is plays like the kid and even still now she has such like a tomboy aesthetic. And so the, it's not convincing at all. Like she's in this dress and you're like, okay, like give it another year and I think yeah. you're going to be a boy again. A symmetrical haircut or something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Think, yeah, Pamela Adlon, short hair at the end with the dress. Yes, I do remember that one. I'm glad you guys brought that up. It's sort of a yeah. lot jewel almost. I mean, it's kind of a weird film, but it's interesting. And I, yeah. I just, you find it on YouTube. The whole film is on YouTube. You can watch mm -hmm. it. So. Yeah, I mean, it also like goes to me, including some like it hot, which like I think, you know, falls into this sort of, I would say like from Shakespeare's time of like cross-dressing rom-coms that are not trans and oftentimes the cross-dressing is played as a joke and I think like the worst of it is that way and feels really bad and it's a lot of like what I think of growing up with like even just like cross-dressing and Monty Python and stuff like that but some like it hot for me whenever I revisit it the the like joy that Jack Lemmon has being a woman feel makes it feel so trans to me and like I, I don't know if it's supposed to be played as a joke but it doesn't feel like that's the joke but I don't know I don't know like how we feel like are there are there ones in that sort of genre whether it's like a Shakespeare play or a movie from the 80s that you really love and are there ones that you still remember as being like sort of traumatizing I, I mean I do love that you got that perspective from some like it hot because I got the same perspective Mm -hmm. it's 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 a movie that like i enjoy watching and i had my actor my acting class like we did like like over the pandemic we did like movie um like book club kind of thing where we'll watch a movie mm -hmm. and we'll talk about it so that was one of the movies that we watched and we talked about over the pandemic and i do appreciate how they just carefully crafted it so that it didn't it didn't feel jokey or like a costume and you know at the end with that line you know uh on the boat it was just so sweet and it was just so it was just so gratifying it was just so different from all the other movies that I was watching growing up that like at the end of that movie like I didn't feel bad about myself 
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> what about you, Eva? Um, I can't think of anything from the 80s, but I don't know if you all have seen Billy Elliot. Um, you know, the movie about the boy who starts dancing, um, his best friend, Michael, uh, would like play with gender and dress. And I watched that movie when I was like 10. And I always thought that Michael would grow up to be a trans woman. And, um, in the last scene when they're like 10, 15 years older, um, like he isn't. And I don't know, like, that's just something I've always kind of like seen um as sort of like um i don't know like there's just like different moments where i saw someone assigned male at birth who was like super feminine and it was kind of like hinted that they were like struggling with gender one way or another and then um you know either they quote unquote like manned up at like the end um or you know they were just like a cis gay man in the end, um, that's the only thing that really comes to mind. Um, but yeah, that's something that I always talk with my friends about, about how like Michael was actually meant to be trans. And I've, I've like, you know, gone through like Reddit threads and there's other people who have the same thoughts. So yeah. I love that. I love how we like find these works and like a lot of us will like find the same things within them. I mean, I also, I know for me, like a lot of, old Hollywood like screw, screwball romantic comedies like really resonate in like a sort of trans way in in this very like I don't know basic maybe even stereotypical way but as a kid they were sort of this version of you know this like soft masculinity that like Cary Grant would have sometimes where he was sort of like bumbling and sensitive and then you'd have like Katherine Hepburn being this like strong powerful woman and at the time I feel like I was so drawn to Katherine Hepburn from like a romantic sense because that's what I was told that I could do and also because how could I not be but also then would like latch on to Cary Grant and I think as I got older I realized that I was sort of like splitting myself I also feel this way about like the before movies like before sunrise and stuff where I'm like oh as a kid I was equally identifying with both of these characters and it was like my like masculine side which was sort of effeminate and the feminine side like having these conversations and like falling in love and it's it's interesting to see that oftentimes in like romance genre is where we get a soft masculinity because they're often like targeted at like cis women and so you get to have like men or I don't have to do quotes I guess they're men like men like who had some of the qualities that I was like bullied for but they're lifted up as like a romantic lead Mm. <clears throat> um, so I want to pivot a little to talk about like what we think that this like absence because it's great that we're finding this and it's great that I can like watch bringing a baby and be like oh my god this feels very trans to me but it's not right like we can also acknowledge that and be like they're what we deserve and what should exist does not exist um, so I'm curious if we could talk about like what we think this absence represents for like society's views of us and what it means to sort of be denied this kind of wish fulfillment love story. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I was actually talking with one of my trans sisters yesterday and we were talking about how when it comes to finding a partner, especially for cis people, trans folks are not something that really comes to mind. Um, uh, you know, I think the way that a lot of us are raised, um, uh, it doesn't, you know, and it, it doesn't even matter, like, class, culture, race, whatever, um, you know, uh, your partner says a lot about who you are. And people have a lot of shame um, with, you know, just kind of buried within their own mm -hmm. hearts, their own minds. And, uh, you know, the thought of being with a trans person, I think, is kind of overwhelming for a lot of folks. Like, even those who do find themselves attract, you know, who like are attracted to us in whatever way, um, whether it's secretive or it is something that they are 
trying to be more open and public about. Um, I think a lot of folks, uh, they, you know, like, I think, um, I think trans people, we kind of represent um, this notion of someone who like defied all odds, who like deviated um, from culture uh, and from what the world wants us to be. And, you know, people just kind of want their like white, you know, like they're like white picket fence, mm -hmm. you know, their, you know, spouse with like the two, you know, with like the 2.5 kids with the dog or like, a cat. And, um, you know, I think the fact that there aren't a lot of trans rom-coms or just even the idea of trans dating being this constant topic of like debate, scrutiny, um, I think it says a lot about how people value us um, and how, you know, they don't want to think of us in that way. Um, I mean, they do obviously, you know, like there's debates about it on Fox News like every other day. Um, but people don't want to think about us, um, especially in like a positive way, in a way of, um, oh yeah, like maybe my son one day will grow up and like marry a trans woman. Maybe my daughter will marry a trans man or whatever. Like people, um, people liked, ooh, there went my my uh, light. Um, mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, they want um, they want like their perfect idea of whatever, and um, I think they see us as wrong, as deviant. Um, <clears throat> and you know, when people go to see some happy, perfect movie about love, um, you know. They don't want to um, have all of the questions running through their mind that trans, that, you know, like trans folks bring up. So, mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's a really, it's a really deep thing. Yeah. I think, I think it's, I agree with everything that Eva is saying. I think it's also says a lot about Hollywood and how much, <clears throat> um, influence and power it has over the world, society and culture. And, you know, rom-coms to me is the most subversively political genre um, <clears throat> because it teaches us who gets to be loved and who doesn't. It teaches us who is deserving of a certain kind of love and a certain kind of partnership. And so if we're constantly centering, you know, cis and white and heteronormative, then we've just been telling Hollywood or the industry through this media has, has just been kind of influencing and telling the world that uh, these very specific type of people um, are deserving and, and are worthy of of being loved or being in a relationship or having a, a happy ending. Mm -hmm. And uh, and basically trans people don't. And so for me, it's like that's that sort of, as a actress and a filmmaker, it's like, it's been sort of like a thing that I'm constantly learning. It's like, oh, it's maybe not necessarily what, how we're perceived or how, the majority of the world feels about us. It's just what we've been putting out there in terms of information and conditioning. And mm -hmm. so it creates that that fear that Eva was talking about of how people um, don't aspire to fall in love with trans people or, or that when they do, they think it's something to be ashamed of. Yeah, I would just I would just add I agree with everything that both Eva and Rain have said, but also that I just think it's still a product of uh, so few trans filmmakers being given access to create work, you know. And we just have such a bottleneck of. I mean, if we just think of, I was actually trying to think. Well, outside of rom coms or what could be construed as a rom com, how many trans comedies have there been made? Or and then I'm like, well, what about trans? genre of films like mysteries or you know what i mean it's just like there's kind of just not that much period and i think it's still just 
Um, because you know, I, I wouldn't really. Um, what I I think I'm I'm certainly not asking is for cis filmmakers to tar- start telling trans rom coms. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying they're not allowed to ever if they do a, an amazing job, but it's not really what is underneath the ask. You know, yeah. Um, it's about access, and I think, okay. um, you know, we still have this this challenge about this catch twenty two about um about recognizable actors and if actors haven't been given the chance and then how that's so connected to financing. And um, so there's that whole thing, which is very old thinking, I think, and, yeah. and to evolve. Um, and it already start, it's starting to evolve in some cases, you're starting to see less, you know, more, more underrepresented types of people um, on streaming and in some films, but you know, we just, we just need to kind of uh, escalate this um, access, the finance, you know, the financial means and the, and the material means, you know, to make more work. So, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I definitely think the material is there now with a lot, well, with, you know, the, this group of people uh, particularly, but also just with how many, you know, uh, filmmakers and actors <clears throat> that are now kind of, you know, um, working their way into into the system and into Hollywood. So, but we just haven't really found that direct line to financing that bridge of getting um, just people to really put their um, uh, wholehearted belief that that this is something that could actually work and and that uh, that people actually want um, because I think we're still stuck in this idea that oh well we already have that one show or we, we already have that one actor actress so you know why do we need another one or why do we why are we listening to this pitch um and i think that that's an archaic you know belief system as well um and it's really hard for people to kind of recondition that thinking and get past that um because there's you know uh, i think I think there's an obsession in a way to our, to trans people's like origin story, like, you know, the transition and, and the struggle and, and, um, and, you know, and how that creates uh, uh, <clears throat> an explosive, you know, dynamic with, with, with their family or their work or whatever, but they can't seem to be able, they can't seem to fathom that there's more story to tell beyond that. And yeah. so we never really get stories about love or healing or even starting from there and seeing what else is 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 beyond that because because there's just isn't that belief that 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 that's even warranted. Yeah, I'm also interested in the romances that are told in trans movies, specifically in trans movies that are made by cis people because that's mostly what's existed. Um, at least in the mainstream, and the fact that like I can think of movies that have that are explicitly trans and have romantic storylines of sorts, but that I wouldn't even like suggest in a a rom com like conversation because it's always filled with like a lot of darkness. Um, and so I also feel like that sort of is connected to all of this, right? Of like the idea that cis people are very aware that either they or other people like are drawn to us but then it's it's this like it's this idea that it has to be done in a way that's taboo and a way that is like i don't know involves death often or at least like some sort of trauma yeah can i ask Actually, Drew, can I ask you, because you, you're such a, um, an expert, I would say, on, you know, queer and trans film history and film history in general. Do you feel like there's a parallel to what you just described to, like, the gay and lesbian, you know, films? And, and, and how close, of a, you know what I mean, in terms of, yeah. like, 30 years ago with gay and lesbian films? Because there was, a, or, you know, further back even, because there was always, for example, like, you know, the trope of the, le- the the doomed lesbian romance where one of them dies, you know, so you kind of have some of these parallels with some of the trans romances you were talking about. Do you think yeah. that very close or? I think it's really close. And I also think it goes to what you were saying about how like the goal should be to have trans creators who are getting to tell a variety of stories because mm-hmm. I could see a world where like, you know, we're having these conversations, we're fighting for 
change and then the changes that happen are done in a way that's simple and not to say that there aren't like a lot of really incredible cis queer rom-coms and romances now because there are but a lot of them are more independent and even among films that are independent on like a Sundance scale a lot still tend to be very sort of like they feel straight but they just are gay right. and I don't necessarily want like a world where it's like oh it's cis but we're casting trans people I mean that'd be great like I obviously would rather that than nothing but it I yeah. think like <clears throat> all of us here could bring more nuance to what a trans rom-com could look like in a way that I hope, like, I hope that's the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I even think about like, I don't know, this, this other movie from like the late nineties, I think like different for girls. That is probably the closest I think there is to, it stars a cis guy as the trans woman, but it's like probably the closest to like hitting basic rom-com beats, but then it has, just like brutal acts of transphobia and like it's so it's so unpleasant it's as if like you know you were watching like a Sandra Bullock rom-com and in the middle of it she was like brutally assaulted and you it would be so like jarring and it would not do well but this idea that even in like that version of, of a cis person being like "Ooh, let's take the rom-com beats and apply it to a trans person like it's gonna be we're, we still need that moment we still need to show like the pain and I just think that there's such a world in between ignoring the differences of being trans and in love in the world and acknowledging them in this way that is like simplistic and violent and painful um but yeah I definitely I definitely think we're sort of at a place like we are in a, in a lot of categories of like for trans people where cis queer people were and the both the ways that were attacked in media whether like directly or through fiction, I think it's, we're seeing like very similar patterns for sure. Um, Reese, I wanna ask you about Adam and about whether you were thinking about like the rom-com genre when, when making that, like, was that something that was very, like, do you think of the movie as a rom-com? Like obviously, well now it's sort of fun because the actor who plays like the cis bisexual girl like is, Right. Isn't this? So like, and you can like read that onto that performer. Um, so, but were you thinking of it as a rom-com? You know, I actually wasn't, but <laughs> so I, well, that's not totally true. I, I wasn't at first, but then um, particularly towards the second half of working on it. And when I was really, so, you know, really zeroing in on um, Adam's relationship with his roommate Ethan, who's played by Leo Shang, that I actually, that relationship is what mm. I wrote the rom-com treatment to, but it was kind of like the secret rom-com of the movie was the bromance between them. Um, and particularly, particularly in the edit, I was like really working with the editor, like let's give Adam and Ethan the rom-com pass. We have to really do eye contact when they first meet, mm -hmm. you know, really kind of, um, we were looking those beats, but um, no, I didn't at first. And, and even for this, this conversation, I was like, Oh, rom-coms, huh? Well, what, what rom-coms do I even like? I wasn't even sure if I liked rom-coms. I had to think about it for a second because I don't, I guess I don't identify as a rom-com fanatic, but then when I thought about it, a lot of movies I love are rom-coms and it's just sort of, it's a funny thing. And I think there might even be some, um, you know, bel belittlement put on this category because it's perceived as for, you know, femme, you know, I think that there's a misogynistic kind of, uh, lens on, on some, on how we talk about rom-coms sometimes, but um, I mean, I'm a lover of like film in general. So I, I, I mean, you know, I, I think we need trans, you know, takes on like the first wives club or something like that. And we also need trans takes on like, you know, really challenging art house, whatever, you know what I mean? And, and sort of everything in between. Um, but you know, you all are raising really important points about, you know, not only how do, do viewers identify, you know, with with um, perspective and, you know, a, an, amor a, an amorous gaze. Can we have an amorous gaze towards a trans person or as a trans character, you know, um, one or the other or both? And, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, the gaze is so important to, to the construction of film history. And it's been the white male gaze for white cis male gaze for so long. Straight, I can add, continue to add qualifiers onto it. But, um, 
you know, I think it just, in a way, it just takes something to kind of break open. I was thinking about, I just saw the film Desert Hearts recently, mm -hmm. um, which was a, um, I don't know if it's a rom-com, it's kind of rom-com, right? It's a romance. It's a, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I call it a rom-com, but it's definitely a romance and there's definitely humor in it. So it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I guess I was I was th interested in it for many reasons. But one one was that it was I think the first film that was directed by a lesbian, the first feature at that time from a lesbian perspective that depicted lesbians. I, I think that's at least how it was presented in the conversation. Maybe I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that's exactly historically. Yeah, I mean, I I was just at a. Were you at the screening in at UCLA? I was. Oh, I was there too. That's so funny. Too? Oh, oh cool. yeah. Um, but yeah, they did say that. And I was, I was like whispering to my friends. I was like, I was like listing off reasons why that's yeah. not true. Because I think like we always have this desire to talk about first, but even yeah. when we get like the first of trans rom-coms, you're going to be able to go back and be like, no, there was this like British movie from the seventies that we can have any feelings about, but you know, we can like, oh, like Alice Jr. This like Brazilian movie is like so good and hits a lot of those beats. So I think like firsts are always a uh, tricky conversation, but Desert Hearts is, it's no, that's incredible. Great. That's totally true. And uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't really around at the time of when that movie had its impact and so on. But, you know, it, it seemed like it, well, I guess what I mean is that if there's, you know, one that kind of just can get out there and break through it can then, you know, then you can it's, it's it can be a, that there's a game changing moments where people are suddenly like, oh, I enjoyed that, even though it wasn't from my lived experience. And I was in that point of view or what I, you know what I mean? And I think it kind of just yeah. takes it kind of essentially takes, you know, some film film gatekeeping financier people to sort of green light something and go for it. And, um, you know, I think that the audience is ready. You know, the audience obviously is kind of chomping at the bit and there's so many different models of distribution and ways to find your audience. Now, I, I will say to the audience who's listening, I hope that people go to the movie theater and go to film festivals like New Fest and do all those things to, to support because that really actually has an important impact on independent filmmaking and filmmakers who are underrepresented. You know, it's like people can get lost in, in the streaming algorithm. So it's actually important to kind of go and take proactive steps to kind of vote with your wallet and stuff like that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I think that's a really good point. And I also like, I can think of rom-coms that are like short films and like, you know, web series, like Rain, like your web series is like very much a rom-com. Um, and so like, I do think sometimes it just takes a little bit more effort mm -hmm. to find the stuff, but because of the internet, if you have access to the internet, like it, there is stuff there. And it doesn't mean that we don't deserve a lot more and deserve it on a larger scale. But I would even say that what we really deserve is like all the people who are making those web series and shorts should get more money so that they could do similar things, but with yeah. more resources, um, which actually brings me to Rain. Is there anything you can tell us about your film? Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're, we're speaking of financing, it's been challenging because of the pandemic uh, kind of, you know, um, uh, putting a halt on a lot of things, including, uh, People wanting to take more risks with with investing in a film like this uh, because of the theaters and all that stuff. Um, but now coming sort of, well, I don't know if we're coming out of the pandemic, but now that we're sort of like here in mm -hmm. 2022, there's a little bit more interest. And so we do kind of have a very soft schedule of shooting um, at the end of this year, like October, November, December, like that's kind of like our soft schedule, but we have to close our financing gap. Um, but the exciting thing is, is we do have a big name uh, um, actor producer who's gonna, who has come on board as executive producer and will be announcing um, that person next week. Uh, and so I'm excited about that because I think that's going to really change the 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 next steps or you know um um people's interests because we you know um have interest in in sort of like the international space because it's a very it's a trans like rom-com but it's also very asian american so like you know the the actress who's playing my mother is like one of the biggest actresses in the philippines which so we got the attention of the philippines um market in that way and 
this announcement next week is going to really get the attention of the American market. And um, I'm really excited about that because there's there's what the challenges that we've been facing is that, you know, me and Rachel Lako and Shant Joshi, uh, who's producing the film with me, um, uh, you know, we're all very young filmmakers and we haven't done anything this big, you know, um, before. It's, it's all of our firsts in a way, even though I've directed and even though that I have a strong, you know, proof of concept and, and well, you know, I'm very consistent. Like, you know, even before Razor Tongue, there was Ryan's and Hacks. And so even though I have that, there's still sort of this like, well, um, what has she done like feature wise? And so there's, we've always been sort of like um, facing these like, well, what's going to come first, you know, um, the financing or like me getting that opportunity that's going to make people think that I'm worth investing in. Um, but this person uh, that that we're bringing on board, I, I think, is going to change that because they they have that resume and they have that that experience on set and and just having their belief and and them sort of like, yeah, this is the project to uh, for me to really put my my money on it and my um, passion into it is going to get everybody else kind of get involved. Um, so that's kind of where we are with with it and and. Um, I'm really excited about that. It's It's been like a long time coming and there are times when I'm just like, gosh, is this ever gonna happen? But um, I, I think it will because because like everyone was saying and Reese kind of mentioned, the audience is ready for it. It's kind of primed. It's kind of, it's just sort of like, it's up to us to kind of really continuing that path and and not giving up and 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 getting getting everybody else to sort of get on board that this is the project to, uh, well, you know, mine and 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 everyone else is that these are the kinds of projects that we need to start investing more in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Eva, is there anything that you can tell us about the film that you shot um, last year? Um, yeah, it's there's so much that I want to say, but sure. I don't want to get in trouble. Absolutely, <laughs> would not want to get you in trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I honestly think a lot of people are going to be really excited for it. And after hearing everything that everyone said on this panel, I think that this film will check a lot of those boxes. Uh, you know, I mean, do not hold me to it. If you hate it, just don't tell me. Um, but I know that I had a lot of fun doing it. And I mean... When I got the script, like the, well, like the first like casting draft, I was like, oh my God, this is actually a happy movie. Wow. Like that's so different. Um, you know, like I didn't have reps or like an agent or anything um, throughout the casting process, but, um, you know, just like being an actor who was trying to get some sort of work, like people would send me scripts for like short films that like they were like working on and it was kind of wild the number of times i got a script that um was like oh yeah trans girl hanging out with friends she gets up to go grab some water and then suddenly she gets like beat up in the middle of the park and i was like oh okay that's cool um not something i think i want to do um and then this and then this film um really is like a whole one, I mean, it's just like a total like 180 from all of that. Um, you know, the character I play named Kelsa, um, she is really just, um, I mean, I, I kind of struggle with saying this, but you know, she really is like just a girl who's just out here like living her life and just, um, uh, how much can I say? Um, you wait, yeah. okay, I have a question. I have a question that can make this easier for you. Okay, okay. I'm curious just what, like, how did it feel? Like, okay, so we know that it's like in the rom-com world yeah. and that it's happy and just like for you as an actor and as a trans person, like what was the experience like filming it and, and like what do you feel like emotionally you're carrying with you after that experience? Honestly, playing Kelsa was kind of trippy at times um 
just because there's a lot of things in our lives that are very similar, um, even beyond us being trans, like even things with like our like families, it's like kind of wild how much, um, just like how many parallels there were with all of that. Um, but I, yeah, I really felt like I was playing um, this kind of like alternate version of myself that like didn't go through um, a lot of my own like personal traumas, you know, mm -hmm. like I literally had to leave a lot of that at the door. And that's something that Billy and I talked a lot about, um, you know, like he would say to me, I want you to lean into the joy, um, you know, and um, yeah, like I had to constantly think of that. Um, and I had to really just kind of like find more of my own joy, um, you know, so even like, you know, a couple of months later after we wrapped the film, I was talking about it with some friends and I was like, you know, that was maybe some of the most fun I've ever had. Um, and I really hope that like translates um, to the audience. Um, but yeah, it was just a lot of fun. Yeah. That's really I, can't, nice. I can't wait to see it. So, um, you know, when it comes out? You know, that is the million dollar question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, the summer tentatively. Um, yeah, yeah, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, but well, I think the trailer is dropping soon. Um, I hope I'm not mm. that, but yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> that's great. I'm so excited to see it. Well, thank you all so much for talking with me and talking about this. Um, can you all just like go around and say where people can find you and your work? Right. Good start. Uh, me? Um, yeah. yeah um, you can find me on Instagram mostly. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't really tweet very much. Um, which So my Instagram is at Rain Valdez, and um, my work is on YouTube. So you can search Rain Valdez Razor Tongue or um, Rain Valdez Ryan's, and you should be able to. Um, uh, yeah, be able to watch my work. It's, it's available on YouTube. It's completely accessible. It's free. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then hopefully Relive would be, will be coming out and well, hopefully we get into production this year and then sometime next year, hopefully I can talk more about uh, when that's coming out. Great. Eva? Um, yeah, mainly Instagram too. Uh, you can find me at at Miss Eva Rain. That's M S, not M I S S. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of my writing is on them and a few other places. But yeah, just follow me on Instagram. Reese. Cool. Yeah, I'm on uh, Instagram and Twitter at uh, at Reese Ernst and. Um, and Adam is on Canopy and iTunes and Amazon and maybe Apple. <laughs> so, enjoy. Um, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at draw underscore Gregory. Um, you can find a lot of my writing at Autostraddle and you can find a trans rom-com that I wrote and directed and starred in on Vimeo if you just search uh, my name and the first time, so um well thank you all so much for being here oh the last thing i'll say is that i'm gonna make a letterbox list with all of the movies that are referenced in this panel so if anyone wants to the good and the bad and so if anyone wants to watch those you'll you'll have an easy list um and you can find that by i don't know going through my socials um thank you all for joining us thank you